Well, the economic impact of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum is quite extraordinary, and it's extraordinary for a couple reasons. One is that when the feasibility studies were done before the museum was built, no one really thought the percentage of our tenants would be as high as it is from out of state. It turns out it's more than 90%, which accounts for the fact that people spend a couple nights, which means that annually we're responsible for more than $100 million of economic impact for the city. And if you go back uh, through our history, which is almost 16 years now, that means it's almost a $2 billion return on a $100 million investment, which everybody thought was kind of nutty when we did it, but it's turned out to be just a gold mine in terms of its uh, impact on the city of Cleveland. Since the museum opened, uh, we've averaged about a half a million people a year, and we're above eight million in, those, in that time frame. And what's so important is every year, it's all 50 states and 100 countries, which again goes back to explain why the economic impact is so high. The inductions are here every three years, and uh, that's great for us because it's about a six or seven million dollar spin that we have to we have to generate that kind of revenue to break even but it, it's again a great investment because the economic impact is uh... somewhere around fifteen million dollars for that week-long series of activities and what it does is it puts us cleveland the great city of cleveland on the media map of the world and on the cultural map of the world we really are a highlight it's one of the most important musical events in any given year and to have it here every three years is just incredible for both marquee value of Cleveland and the economic impact. Well, not, uh, the new exhibit, Women Who Rock, uh, really has had great traction, but not just with Cleveland, around the world. We've had incredible stories in the Wall Street Journal, all the major uh, wire stories, uh, everywhere and what's so great is that it really underscores not only our commitment to doing world-class exhibits but our commitment to education because this exhibit is not just about women in music it's examining the marginalized voices of women in music and society so it really underscores how much we try to dig down into these subject matters when we do when we do these exhibits and i expect that we'll have an extraordinary success with this from folks coming from all over there's just a great outcry from women saying you know we're so glad you did this, and, and as I've said to them, you know, we came to this maybe later than we should, but we now are examining it. It's a fabulous exhibit with all the right undertones about why it's here. It's interesting, the educational aspect of the museum, that's half of our mission when you look at it, is probably the untold story. Um, so many folks think of it as just as exhibit-driven, destination-driven, but we really spend an inordinate amount of our resources on making sure that the power of this music called rock and roll, this very broad-based definition we use, is used to educate children and students of all ages. We have the most award-winning and celebrated education program coming out of a fine arts museum in the United States, and that starts with toddlers at risk in the inner city with our uh, toddler rock program where they are, uh, we approach an, uh, have an approach to trying to improve their cognitive learning abilities by teaching them uh, letter recognition, rhyming, alliteration. We test them at the beginning, test them at the end. Their cognitive abilities go up dramatically. We have our first through twelfth grade uh, rock in the schools programs, which uses music to teach math, science, social studies, language, arts, and finance. We do about twenty thousand kids a year in that program in the building. And then our distance learning website, which teaches the same courses, have been voted the best distance learning website for content by teachers over the last three years. And we reach forty-one states and eight countries, and we teach both of these in English and Spanish. So we're doing a great job reaching the traditional market of toddlers to 12th grade. We also have classes at Case, uh, CSU, and soon at Tri-C. Our library is going to open to the public next January, which will be the most unique single source place to study and investigate the history of rock and roll and the cultural impact of that music. So we're really, we cover all the bases. It's a very, very extensive program and one that has rightfully so been awarded uh, many sort of uh, uh, accolades for all the good work that we've been able to do with this and using the music that's really changed the world. Using the word tipping point is the one that I use because I think we're really poised. We've got this $2 billion worth of investment and I think Cleveland's really going to take off. And we recognize that both these uh, entities, both the casino and in the medical mart with the convention center, will bring many more people from outside of Cleveland to the city. 
and that means more visitors to the Rock Hall. So what was really important to me is that we have some relationship with both those entities. So we have board members from the casino and board members from the medical mart that become intimately involved in our programs and we're already working with both of them to talk about ways that we can make sure that we help them bring people to Cleveland and then when they get here those folks will come to the museum and someone will have a very special experience based on their clientele so we're excited about that. The Library and Archives it, again on our education side it is very significant but also I believe that over time Res, uh, residents and tourists will realize that there's a secondary experience to be had at the library, which is free to the public. And starting next January, you'll be able to go in there, watch any movie you can think of, listen to any CD, maybe a record or a 45, read any rare book, common book, periodicals, out of print material, and really immerse yourself in sort of the, uh, the literary and visual side of rock and roll that ha is not, we're not able to present that totally in the museum here. So it'll be really, I think, a secondary experience for a lot of folks and particularly for local residents. We are lucky because we do own a unique brand and mark called the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, we maintain that, uh, we watch uh, assiduously around the world to make sure nobody's creeping up us on that. And it is, when you look at Q scores around the world for recognition, uh, I always said that it was us and LeBron, and I said that he wouldn't be here forever. I didn't realize he'd be gone so soon. But, you know, the Rock Hall is the brand that when you're in the Middle East, you might be uh, climbing a pyramid. Somebody will say, where are you from? Cleveland. They'll say, Cleveland rocks, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And we really think that, you know, Cleveland needs to brand itself around Cleveland Rocks. We believe that because this is a phrase that's inculcated in popular culture. You can't buy this, you can't even create it, you can't hire a marketing firm to create this brand. And it's, it's a slogan or a brand that's been here long before the museum. It's a generic verb that talks about how great this city is. All these assets, culturally and otherwise, that mean so much to us here in Cleveland, they all rock. And, and we're very much uh, on the forefront of trying to make sure that we push this idea that Cleveland Rocks and make sure that it's not just about the Rock Hall, it's not self-serving to us in the sense that a lot of people believe it is, but the fact that we can all come under that umbrella and adopt this, this sort of slogan that means so much to all of us uh, in terms of music, but also should mean so much to us in terms of how we brand the city.